Hey everyone, Reflected here. With Beware Beware, my upcoming Spitfire campaign just around the corner, and The Big Show, released in 2018, I wanted to make a definitive, ultimate Spitfire tutorial that covers everything you need to know in order to survive these campaigns. That's the beauty of realistic campaigns. You may get away with only knowing some of the basics when flying instant action missions, but there's no way you'll make it back from a rodeo to Saint-Omer if you're sloppy. Before jumping into the cockpit, let's open the controls menu. The Spitfire had very, very sensitive elevator controls. As Jeffrey Wellen once said, There you are, careering around at 300 knots in this thing. Just the slightest thought that goes through your brain, conveys it to your hands, and your feet, and the next thing you know, the aeroplane's doing it. The real Spitfire column is over 80 centimeters long. Moving it a few centimeters back and forth translates into a much smaller degree movement than if you move a normal everyday joystick a few centimeters. Even with the real stick, you had to have a light touch. With our joysticks, it's very hard not to over control. The greatest solution to this is to have a Spitfire column from Authenticate. If, however, you want to use a normal joystick, it's best to set up your curves properly. I see many posts on the DCS forums recommending an insane amount of curve for the elevator axis. If I set it way up, yes, it will be smooth here around the middle, but once you pull the stick more than halfway back, it will become exponentially more twitchy than without any curves. It's counterproductive. I recommend not to use a curve setting over 10, maybe 15. The less you can get away with, the better. But what if that's still not enough? Instead of increasing the curve, I suggest you change the saturation and sacrifice the last 10 to 15% in the extremities. This will flatten the curve evenly but you won't be able to fully pull back on the virtual stick, which is not very often needed anyway. This only goes for the pitch axis. In my experience, the roll axis doesn't need a lot of tweaking. Okay, here we are in the cockpit. First, we make a left to right sweep to make sure every switch is set correctly. In DCS, they always are, but it's good to form these habits just in case you ever get to fly a real spit. Okay, side door closed, radiator switch off, so auto, pitot heat off, fuel pump off. These switches down here are quite hidden and hard to see or click, so you better assign a key combo or a button on your hotest to find them. Carburetor air filter off, mixture idle cutoff, both magnetos off, oxygen supply full, you'll need it. Check that you have at least 220 uh, PSI of pneumatic supply pressure. Set the altimeter to zero or to Q and H. I recommend this letter unless you just practice around the airfield. Set the Q and H pressure in this little window and if you do it correctly, the deals will show you the field's elevation. Verify that the supercharger is set to auto. Check the fuel quantity. The needle will only come alive when you keep this button depressed. This gauge only shows the contents of the bottom tank. It starts moving once the 48 gallon top tank is empty. Fuel tank pressure cock off. Main and drop tank fuel cocks both off. Landing gear lever in the down position. We select flaps down and verify that the mechanical indicators on the wings are deployed. Now raise the flaps. Finally, wipe the controls and check for free and unrestricted movement. We are good to go. Time to start the engine. 
set the brakes and ask the ground crew to connect the trolley ACK or in DCS the ground power. We could start the engine on the internal battery but its capacity is too small for such heavy duty operation which would reduce its life. Chief, turn on the ground power. Copy. Ground power is now on. We turn on the battery by opening the throttle halfway. It automatically flicks the battery switch on. We verify that the undercarriage down light and the low fuel pressure warning lights come on. Then we pull the throttle back to half to one inch open. Propeller RPM control fully forward. Trim all the way back to tail heavy to minimize the chances of the propeller hitting the ground, just in case. Carburetor air filter on. Main fuel cock on. Now we need to pressurize the fuel lines. We can do that by turning on the pressure cock for 30 seconds and turning it off, or by operating the hand pump here until the light goes out. Now we need to get some fuel into the cylinders so that the engine can start. We do that by unscrewing the Kai gas primer pump and giving it a few good strokes. The amount of strokes you need depends on the outside temperature. Now it's 15 degrees Celsius, so we need around 6 to 7 strokes. In real life, you'd feel a sudden increase in resistance when all the suction and delivery pipes are full. Let's open the covers of the starter and the booster coil buttons. The starter engages the starter motor and turns the propeller around, while the booster coil provides extra voltage to the spark plugs to make sure the engine catches. It's time to verify nobody's hiding under the nose or walks into the spinning propeller, so shout All clear! Switch is on! Then flip both magnetos on. Hold the stick back to make sure the aircraft doesn't nose over. You'll need both hands, so it's best to use your legs to do this. Press both the starter and the booster coil buttons with two fingers. V for victory! As soon as the engine catches, move the mixture lever forward to the auto position and release the starter. If required, keep the booster coil depressed and operate the primer until the engine runs smoothly. It's best to have a keyboard or hotess assignment for everything. Stabilize the RPM at around 1000 or 1200 RPM. The first thing you need to check is the oil pressure. It has to rise. If it doesn't, shut it down immediately. Close the starter covers and screw the primer back in. If the old pressure is ok and the fuel pressure light doesn't come on, switch on the fuel pump. The generator is charging so now we can tell the ground crew to disconnect the trolley act. Chief, turn off the ground power. Copy. Ground power is now off. Then we turn on our radio to whatever channel the airfield's tower is set to. Also, turn on the pitot heating, otherwise you may lose your instruments on a cold day. Now we have to wait for the engine to warm up. We need a minimum of 15 degrees of oil temperature and 60 degrees of coolant temperature. If you want to accelerate the process, you can open the throttle a little. This will be limited by a rise in the oil pressure. You mustn't exceed 120 psi. You can lower that needle though by keeping the oil dilution button down here depressed. When the needle moves down you can open the throttle a little more. While the engine warms up, we can test a few things. Turn on the gun sight, adjust the brightness with this knob here, and set the wingspan and range as desired. Turn on the external tank's cock and turn off the main one. Run the engine on the slipper tank for a minute to make sure it feeds. Don't forget to switch back to the main tank before takeoff. Then, 
we need to test the radiators. They automatically close as much as possible in order to minimize drag while keeping the engine from overheating. We need to verify that they can open though. Press and hold the radiator test button down here, again use a keyboard assignment, and your ground crew will verify that the radiator flaps open. As soon as you release the button, they will close. Once you reach the minimum temperatures, you can run up the engine. Open up to zero boost, stick fully back. Depress the supercharger test button and hold it. The light should come on and there should be an increase in boost. All good, you can release the button. Now let's exercise the prop control. Move the lever fully back, let the RPM drop, then move the lever fully forward and watch the RPM rise. Do this at least twice. Then comes the magneto check. There are two circuits in case one should fail, so we need to verify that both work without the other. Turn off mag 1 and watch the RPM drop. Flick it back on, then do the same with mag 2. If any of the drops exceed 150 RPM, the aircraft must not be flown. Don't forget to set your direction indicator to the magnetic heading. First you need to align your compass like this with the magnetic north and then you can set the same heading on your DI. Okay, temperature is in the green, throttle back, we're ready to taxi. Release the brakes and off we go. Get some speed at 1500 RPM then pull the throttle back to 1000 RPM or below. Most players try to taxi too fast and then they are surprised how hard it is to control the aircraft. Don't exceed 10 knots. At low speeds, the rudder is not efficient due to the lack of airflow over it, so you'll need to use the brakes. It doesn't have toe brakes like American or German fighters. You operate the brakes with this lever here. The brake pressure is distributed between the wheels proportionally to your rudder input. So with full right rudder, pulling this lever will only apply pressure to the right wheel. With the rudder centered, pressure will be applied to both wheels equally. When you taxi and want to change direction, you apply full rudder, then gently tap on the brake just a little bit until the nose starts moving. It's harder to control with the button. The longer you press it, the more you pull on the lever. If you don't have a Spitfire column, it's better to assign it to a toe brake axis. You can be more gentle on the brakes then. The long nose blocks your view, so taxi in an S pattern looking out over the side of the cockpit. Also, note where the horizon intersects the windscreen. This is your three-point attitude. This is what you want to see when you flare on landing. As you take the runway, roll forward a bit to straighten the tailwheel, then stop. Now the takeoff. It's important that the aircraft is trimmed properly. It will make or break your takeoff roll. Set the rudder trim all the way to the right, so forward. And set the elevator trim one division nose down. Now this one division nose down worked perfectly when I had a Microsoft Force Feedback 2 uh, joystick. Since I'm using a Thrustmaster, I find that I need one division nose up. I guess this will vary depending on what stick you use. You need to experiment with it. Here's what will happen. I release the brakes. Pull the stick fully back and open the throttle to plus 2 plus 4 boost. As soon as the airspeed indicator needle starts to move, I gently move the stick slightly forward from center to raise the tail. Too far forward and the propeller will strike the ground. As the tail comes up, the gyroscopic forces kick in and want to make the aircraft swing left. Be prepared to counter it with right rudder. It's nowhere near as bad as in the 109 though. When the tail is up, open the throttle gently to plus 7 or, if fully loaded, to plus 9 boost, not more. The aircraft will fly off the ground while keeping the bottom of the windscreen lined up with the horizon. Do not let the nose come higher than that. All the way during the takeoff roll, correct with quick but firm rudder inputs. 
a burst of full rudder, then back to center. If you keep the rudder deflected until the kick takes effect, it's already too much, you overcontrolled it. This is a common mistake. Better give two kicks of uh, full right rudder than to apply half and keep it there and over control. In real life it's much easier to anticipate these uh, no swings because as we say, the skin on your ass starts sliding. Okay, let's do it. Here we go. As soon as you're airborne, raise the undercarriage and open the throttle to plus 12 boost to minimize the possibility of lead fouling up the spark plugs. Keep the shallow climb angle until you reach approximately 180 miles per hour, which is the best climb speed of the Spitfire. Then pull the nose up and climb at an angle so as to maintain that speed. When you reach a safe altitude of at least 500 feet AGL, reduce power to plus 7 then pull the RPM back to 2650 and close the sliding hood. Retrim the aircraft for a horizontal flight. You can now turn off the carburetor air filter, turn on the gun sight, turn on the drop tank's fuel cock and turn up the main tank. If it doesn't feed, you may as well land immediately. Turn on the IFF if required by the mission. Cruising in the spit is easy. Max cruise setting is 2650 RPM and plus 7 boost. You can run all day at these settings. Mind you, fuel consumption is 80 gallons per hour. If you don't have a whole lot of fuel left, which was a common occurrence when uh, returning from sorties over northern France, especially after prolonged dogfights, further reduce your power to save fuel at minus 4 boost and 1800 RPM, fuel consumption drops to 30 gallons per hour. Never use high boost settings with low RPM as it can damage the engine. To avoid this, always reduce the boost first and then pull the RPM back. When applying power, increase RPM first, then increase boost. There is a catch though. At the moment of recording this video, the Spitfire's cooling model in DCS is broken. It has been for years and I really wish ED would fix it finally. In DCS, it's quite possible to overcool your engine, especially at low power settings, high altitudes and low temperatures, exactly the situation you'll find yourself in when flying realistic missions. You'll see the coolant temperature drop below 60 Celsius and the oil pressure rise above 120 PSI. This would never happen in real life. To keep your engine alive, keep the oil dilution button depressed for a few seconds until the oil pressure drops below 120. You can also get into a side slip, then increase power for a few seconds to warm up your engine. The side slip will ensure that you don't pull ahead of the formation while doing so. These are in-game tricks that won't be needed when ED finally fixes the cooling model. Climbing. According to RAF tactics, the wing usually set out at zero feet, then started climbing like hell mid-channel. This was needed to remain undetected by enemy radars for as long as possible. Likewise, strict radio silence was in effect. Normally, you would climb at plus 12 boost and 2850 RPM, raising the nose so as to maintain 160-180 miles per hour, your best climb speed. In DCS, however, the AI is hard-coded to climb quite hard. 
Once you understand what they are doing though, it's quite easy to anticipate their moves and follow them so you won't lag behind. They climb at 99% RPM and sometimes as much as plus 14 or 16 boost. They are also perfectly trimmed all the time. Make sure you are too, otherwise you'll never catch them. Keep the ball, or in this case, the needle, centered. The most common mistakes are not applying enough power or pulling the nose too high and letting the speed bleed. Never let it go below 160 miles per hour. Never try to point your nose at the aircraft you're following. That means you are climbing at a steeper angle and you will not be able to keep up. As the boost drops with altitude, keep applying more throttle to maintain the desired boost. Don't worry about your engine as long as you have sufficient speed. Fortunately, engine limits are not hard limits in DCS. It's not like in certain other games where the stopwatch starts once you go past the power setting and after exactly X minutes your engine dies. In real life these limits were only recommendations in order to preserve the engine. You didn't get a brand new aircraft for each mission like we do. So don't worry, your engine will be fine. Fighting. The Spitfire turns better than anything else in a 1v1 situation. As long as you don't pull too hard. Remember how sensitive the elevator is. This is exacerbated at high altitudes where the air is thinner. As soon as you feel the aircraft shudder, you're on the edge of a stall. Keep it there. The Spitfire's wings are slightly twisted forward. The wingtips have a smaller angle of incidence than the wing roots. So when the wing roots have already stalled past the critical angle of attack, the wingtips are still flying and you still have aileron control. Although a large deflection of the ailerons uh, in this situation can make the wingtip go past the critical AOA and you can easily find yourself in a spin in the opposite direction. At high AOA, I always use more rudder than ailerons to roll for this very reason. But you'll never be in a prolonged turn fight in historically accurate settings like my campaigns. In a large furball, situational awareness is life. Never ever latch on to a single aircraft and chase him. Another one will get behind you and shoot you down, for sure. Always prioritize checking your six. Then, if you get an opportunity to fire at an enemy aircraft, good, take it. But staying alive is the only goal. The other mistake people can make is following the AI in the vertical and ending up with no airspeed at high power settings. The engine will overheat in a few seconds. So always make sure you have sufficient airflow going through your radiators and if not, chop the throttle in time before you kill the engine. In historical missions such as my campaigns, the best advice is still Sailor Milan's 10 rules of air fighting. Ignore them at your own peril. Number 1. Wait until you see the whites of his eyes. Fire short bursts of 1-2 to two seconds and only when your sights are definitely on. 2. While shooting, think of nothing else. Brace the whole of the body, have both hands on the stick, concentrate on your ring sight. 3. Always keep a sharp lookout. Keep your finger out. 4. Height gives you the initiative. 5. Always turn and face the attack. 6. Make your decisions promptly. It's better to act quickly even though your tactics are not the best. 7. Never fly straight and level for more than 30 seconds in the combat area. 8. When diving to attack, always leave a proportion of your formation above to act as top card. 9. Initiative, aggression, air discipline and teamwork are the words that mean something in air fighting. And the last one, go in quickly, punch hard and get out. Let me say a few words about gunnery. The Spitfire 9 has two 20mm Hispano cannons and four 303 Browning machine guns. These are spread all along the leading edge of the wing and if they fired straight forward, they would hit all over the place except where your gun sight is aimed at. 
Therefore, they harmonized the guns to converge at a distance of 300 yards ahead of the aircraft. If the enemy is at this distance, your burst will pack quite a punch, and it will be most effective. As soon as you get too close or too far, your bullets will spread wider and wider apart, and your burst will become less and less effective. So how do you know when your target is at 300 yards exactly? Easy. Set the wingspan of your target over here, 35 feet for German fighters, and set the desired distance here, 300 yards. When the wingspan of the enemy fills the gap between the two horizontal lines of the gun side, you'll know he's exactly at a distance of 300 yards. This is a lot more important in DCS2 than many people would think. If you have the impression that your enemy is a flying tank, it's probably because you're not firing from the optimal range. Also, keep in mind that the cannons have a much lower rate of fire, so a larger gap between the rounds, and much less rounds to begin with. Use them more sparingly and only in lower deflection situations, or when you're absolutely sure to hit. The 4303s on their own are quite ineffective, especially when not fired from the correct distance. It's time to land! Turn on the carburetor air filter and set the RPM to 2700. Overfly the runway with plenty of speed and then brake up and downwind. Should you have an engine failure, you should still be able to convert your speed into altitude and perform a dead stick landing. The direction of the brake should follow the regulations of the airfield or, if there are no regulations but there is some crosswind, brake away from the wind so that when you're turning on final, low and slow, you'd be flying into the wind. It's much safer that way. As you bleed your speed, open the sliding hood and straighten out downwind at 1000 feet AGL. As the speed drops below 160 miles per hour, lower the gear. At 140, lower the flaps and push the RPM lever fully forward. Dirtying up will make the aircraft nose heavy, so be prepared to compensate with nose up trim. When your wing points at the end of the runway, it's time to initiate your turn on final. Instead of a rectangular pattern, we'll fly a curved approach, like they did in World War II, and only straighten out moments before flaring. This way, you can keep an eye on the touchdown point, the long nose won't block it. Trim your speed to 110 miles per hour and keep the speed there with the elevator, while constantly glancing at the touchdown point and keeping the aircraft on the glide slope with the throttle. Too high, reduce power. Too low, add power. Don't choose the elevator for these corrections. As you pass the threshold, Leave the speed to 95, cut the throttle, and level the wings. Remember where the horizon intersected the canopy frame on the ground? That's the three-point attitude you're going for. Flare as low as possible. If you hit the ground too hard, or not at a three-point attitude, the Spitfire will bounce. It's because the tail drops onto the ground, and that increases the angle of attack of the wings. They'll suddenly produce more lift, and you're airborne again. If it drops a wing on touchdown and feels out of control, raise the flaps immediately. Using full kicks on the rudder, but not keeping it there, can keep the aircraft straight until you're quite slow. Don't use the brakes. The aircraft can nose over easily. As you run out of speed, you'll need to start using differential braking to keep her straight and then come to a stop. Raise your flaps if you haven't already and turn off the fuel pump. Now you can taxi back to dispersal. Stick back into your lap. Stopping the engine is quite straightforward. We turn off every electrical system that we don't need. Pitot heating, radio, gun side, IFF. Set the brakes and pull back on the stick. Open the throttle to zero boost to clean the spark plugs, count to four, then pull the mixture lever to idle cutoff. 
As the RPM drops below 1000, open the throttle fully. This will get some fuel into the cylinders and next time the engine will start more easily. After, and only after, the blades stop turning, turn off the magnetos. Turn off the main fuel tank and the master switch below the throttle. Open the side door, undo your harness and get out of the aircraft. Time to go see Spy, the squadron intelligence officer, and to fill out a Form F, your after action report. Then, of course, off to the pub. First round's on you. This is everything you need to know about the Spitfire in order to safely complete my campaigns and other realistic missions. I hope you found it helpful and managed to learn something new. If you think I forgot about some details or my information was not correct, please let me know in the comments. As a real pilot said, the Spitfire is a delight to fly, but she's a bitch on the ground. With a little practice, however, you'll see it's not very difficult to take off and land like a wing commander. It's certainly much easier than the 109. Alright, thanks for watching and stay tuned for further campaign updates. See ya!